Now before I get on to the subject that I actually want to talk about today, I just wanted to remind people there's still three days left to have your say and make a submission to the Tweedshire Council over DA 21-0010. If you're wondering what that is, that's all that black mark in the middle of all that greenery. And when you look at it in this perspective of the larger area that it would impact all around here and what, what isn't in the picture, you realise that this is taking a huge chunk out of an already um, diminished area. I mean, at some stage we have to say there is a stop line there but you can't go any further in certain of these areas because this wilderness, this heritage area, this na these national parks need to be protected. Because without the wildlife and the habitat, we can't exist on this planet. We need to protect it more, not, not wipe it out. Uh, I thought it very appropriate to actually, yeah, when I opened the program and all these black blobs came up and I thought, yep, that kind of represents it. Because what you're looking at in the black blobs there are actually the developable areas, the allocated dwelling lots with their exclusive use areas. Uh, Forty of those have only got an acre but the rest have got their 2.47 acres, which is the equivalent of one hectare. So I'm not going to go too much more into the issues. I mean, I think that these have been explored very well by all the people that have responded to this threat in the environment. And it is a threat to the environment. And in the best case arguments I've heard from people, it's like, but it's going to provide housing. And, you know, we don't have enough housing and people are homeless. And, you know, people just don't get the concept of suburban development. And, oh, I tell you what, I thought, oh, you poor thing. We get the concept of suburban development. This is the country. This is not suburbia. Okay? You cannot bring suburbia to the country. Because then it's not the country anymore. It's suburbia. Didn't you want to get away from suburbia? Oh, yes. What was her name? River. Some River something. Oh, when she said, you know making herself out like she knows all this stuff and says you just don't get suburban development. It's like, oh, you must be young, dear. Suburban development? Oh, people in the country understand it full, fully well because most people have moved away from the suburban development. Oh, you twit. Everybody loves... Um, Yukai, it's a, a beautiful little town, it's got character and it it provides facilities for locals in the area. And what they propose here at Nightcap is to be bigger than Yukai. To, it is, in essence, wanting to create suburbia in the country. And all the arguments that they can come up with is that it's going to give the tribes free housing. No, it's not. It's not going to give anybody free housing. Because ultimately, you have to look at where the end game is for rural land sharing communities in the Tweedshire Council. They have started in an area that doesn't allow them for a start. They have to use a clause under the SCPP to even propose what they're doing. Now what they're proposing, the SCPP is quite clear. A single lot, 
no subdivision. The developers are very clear. There are 21 lots, not a single lot, and they want to subdivide it and make 10 lots that they can each have a rural land sharing community lot allocated to them. But it's not really 10 lots. It's really one and we're going to govern it under the one. Well, none of these provisions are in the state environmental planning provisions policy. It's just not there. For them to do multiple lots, subdivide, and then have more than one rural land sharing community. They propose 10, 10, but they then want to control those 10 little communities as one. There is absolutely no provision for that in either the state laws or the local laws. So they're going to, when they get knocked back on this development application, they're then going to go marching into court with all their defiance. But that's another issue I won't get into right now. Let's zoom on in on the monstrosity a little bit closer. And I want to bring your attention to activities. And I've highlighted this little area down here because even though it's not stated as being part of the development, I want to point out something rather intriguing that does actually involve three and a half thousand acres of a development. So it would, um, first of all, it involves Misty Mountains. Now we know that Misty Mountains Cabins is located over here under these two envelopes here and that's the camping site and the facilities amenities are down here for it. And as you can see when I allocated the exclusive use areas the only way I could stick in a house with these amenities was on a very you know rather large chunk but it's still only an acre block and it's right next door to tourist accommodation facilities so you have to imagine that if I had all the houses on you'd see houses all the way through so you're going to come away to get away from the, the city and you're going to come up here go past people's houses and camp amongst them that's going to be fun isn't it but according to the development application that's been lodged. These cabins aren't here, they're located on a strip that goes down here, a tiny little strip that's down here, or perhaps it's this little bit of that lot number that they referred to that's actually part of Mandalay Road. Well I don't think the cabins and the campsite would actually be on the road, so thereby they would expect that this little Lot 2 that they mention now on that DP over here is where these cabins and campsites are located. So they've got them out of the picture so they don't have to worry about, you know, the inconvenient fact that, well, they're sticking houses up all around it. But then there's been this activity going on down at 100 Tents. Now 100 Tents is also land owned by Peter Van Lyshout. Most of this land is still owned by Peter Van Lyshout, even though it might be under some type of contract to MCV Enterprises who or whoever, whatever company, you know, they used to sign it up in. But, uh, I mean, that's more a closely guarded secret, more guarded than the crown jewels. There's not a lot of the deals that go on amongst all these people that is upfront and honest. Well, Peter Van Lyshout, you know, years ago at the when he was merging with Buller Buller and expanding out into using Buller Buller to using all this land of Peter Van Lyshout's. He hadn't even spoken to Dolph Cook who is part owner of one of the lots, he's saying, yeah, yeah, let's go in and do this. And there's also mention of Dimitri and not Darko Kovac, who's named at the moment. So 
Maybe after Peter Van Lyshout talked to Dolph and Dimitri, Dimitri said, oh, stuff this, I'm out of here. And that's when they bought in Darko. And we have actually been able to identify Darko through um, videos at the Cannabis University. So very interesting, uh, finding out a little bit more on that side too. But there's a lot of activities that are going on to do with Peter Van Lyshout and Dolph Cook that are, seem to conflict with this development application. And what's been going on down here now at um, 100 tenths also seems to conflict with the development application because this uh, Misty Mountains tourist accommodation up here has an identifi identifiable development application and approval. You, you know it exists. But it also likewise does does intend to continue operating in a rural land sharing community where those activities are not permitted unless previously approved which I'm thinking that they think well we've got approval to operate it now so it is pre-approved but the thing is that the approval that is existing now for Misty Mountains tourist accommodation would need to be reviewed with its position no longer being in a bushed area, but in a residentially zoned area. So there would have to be considerations made to the approval given, amendments that the applicant would actually be expected to make to keep that approval. But then that's where you have the problem because to operate to get that approval to operate within a rural land sharing community, you can't get that off the Tweed Shire Council because it's not allowed in their shire. So you can't get permission from the Tweed Shire Council to operate the business inside the rural land sh share community because they don't allow it. So this is why I think they've tried to move it out of the area because the land strip that this lot too that they have put Misty Mountains on wasn't actually part of the original development application diagram and the titles. It had been added in. Almost like, well, let's just add that bit in and just move the cabins and say they're over there, but we're not going to, that's not developable, that's nothing to do with it. So then we can just say that that's okay to stick the houses here and then they'll think that we're operating the business that isn't inside a rural land sharing community and then we won't need to get our approval changed. Well, that's really tricky, but that's just only one part of Peter Van Lyshout's endeavours that I really don't know how he's going to justify. Because this one is down here in the pink, is... 100 tents. There is actually facilities there for um, camping amenities. And it's also got a registered ABN. But like so many of the activities that go on, there's no development application, there's no approval. So there is no way of knowing what activities they're supposed to be allowed to do on this property. But when you do look up a hundred tents, this is, they have a Facebook page. Just one second. Now that little parcel, that pink parcel I showed you, is not three and a half thousand acres. It's a lot, lot smaller. In fact, three and a half thousand acres pretty much describes what's part of Nightcap on Menjimble. Now as you can see here that Misty Mountains 100 tents camping the charges $20 per night for adults I'll tell you what they make a lot of money a three and a half thousand acre property alright so they're not just set up on that lot this 
hundred tenths is offering three and a half thousand acres. And unpowered, many unpowered and some powered bush camping catering for up to 600 people in many private locations. Now there has been some discussion about prior DA approval that exists for a previous owner on this lot of land. Not the whole Peter Van Weishout's three and a half thousand acres. And the approval was certainly not for 600 people that can come in. And there was a limit on how many vehicles could actually be coming and going from that property each day because there could not be too much of a traffic load as well as a density of people load at any one time. So actually if you look at the 100 tents that is a registered business by Peter Van Leishout. It is managed by a trust. And as soon as I see trust, I see tax dodge. Because people that do not want to justify their income too greatly will only set up ABNs and usually it will be through some form of trust, association, incorporation or something that actually says basically we can tell you what we want to outside on the surface but what goes on really is nanya and ultimately this is where you know from the perspective of searching companies a car, you know, if it's just a small tradie or something like that or uh, someone running a sole business as an ABN, that's perfectly normal. But it's when you get these enterprises that are deliberately setting up a company that is managed by a trust and things like that, it, it's like, yes, you get a little bit, why are you moving it through so many things and making it difficult to actually pinpoint down one where the money is and going and who's responsible for it but you see ultimately when it comes to proprietary limited companies you always have to end up with someone that is going to be physically responsible for it whereas in an incorporation association trusts and things like that it's a very blurry line that can be created there. So all the profits from this camping end up being managed by this trust of Peter Van Leishout's. And he's advertising three and a half thousand acres. Now if you want me to show you how big <laughs> this pink square is, let me just bring it up here. So the benefit of Google Earth and creating your polygons is you are actually able to define an area. This area down here that is 100 tenths is 16.4 acres. So it is definitely not 3,500 acres. So as it can only represent all the other properties that Peter Van Leishout owns and he incorporates with his business here. So the question would then be, does he continue to operate this hundred tents and offer all this three and a half thousand acres to all the paying campers just so they can roam and wander wherever they want? I mean, where is the boundaries that are defined for what can go on here? Even continuous, non-stop, doof doof. <laughs> uh, that got you a long way, didn't it? With your doof doof over the weekend. And here we are, my daughter said to me in the car today, that Sydney is going through that once in a hundred year flood 
and they don't expect the rains to stop. And here at 100 tents, there are over 100 people, hundreds of people, that have been there since Friday night partying on. And they're going to get to be drowned rats. It's going to rain and rain, and if the river hasn't started to rise already, well, I suppose they're lucky that they're actually on this side of the river rather than having to cross a bridge to get out. And that's actually a bit of a problem that Mark Darwin also found too when he was setting up his place over here on 3222, is that when it does start to rain, forget about trying to get in because people backslide. You can get no grip on the dirt roads going up these hills. You could lose control coming down hills and all you can do is go with the slide and hope it doesn't kill you. So rather than risk it, Mark Darwin actually spent a lot of time in motels and hotels in Lismore because, well, if the bridge wasn't flooded, he certainly it had been raining too much and he wasn't going to risk it. But the good thing about bringing PVL in, Peter Van Leisch out into the deal was that that opened up all of this land up here and they had better roads. So they didn't have to worry about over here. But anyway, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself because that's actually why I am doing this video today, believe it or not, <laughs> even though I've been yakking on about other things, is the voxes that I've got and how I intend to make a, well, I don't know, for those that are sort of older and <laughs> remember laying in bed listening to your tranny radio, you know, with the some TV, um, some radio serial on there and uh, some of them were really suspense dramas and you could hear them doing all the sound effects. I mean, it was quite... <laughs> hey, when you're kids yeah, and there's nothing, we didn't have all the stuff you got today. So yes, and plus you could sneak the little tranny radio under the, the covers and turn it down really low so mum would think you were in better sleep. <laughs> but anyway, that's my plan to put, there's over, well there's over 1300 voxes and around 27 hours. Some of those voxes after I've had to take out the name so that the file identification would revert it back into the order that they were made. Uh, so that I can provide them in a sequential um, order so that you can follow through on a conversation and get the gist of things. And getting the gist of things, if you are not familiar with Buller Buller, Mark Darwin, Adrian Brennock, Mark McMurtry, Philip Dixon, Cherie Stokes, Derek Zillman, well then you need to go back and find out who these people are from all the other videos and then come back and start to listen to the conversations involving these people. As I saw someone wrote a comment about some, one of the voxes that I've just released with Adrian Brennock and the poor dear was so confused she couldn't figure it out that well you know if he's for the development and everything you know and it's like, oh no, people clearly don't understand that what people are told by the current developers is what people have heard before, what people bought in on before. But what you need to see is the real story. The real characters, the ones that are pulling the strings and those that are also well, you'd class them as being the upper management, but they're also having their strings pulled by a few too, because, you know, Shrildebeast? Oh, that's you, Cheryl. Yes. <laughs> Cherie, sorry. Shrildebeast. Cherie Stokes. And, uh, yes, there's 
quite a bit of internal politics that you can hear going on. And these, Adrian Brannock is, well, clearly from the Voxes, not stable, full of, uh, probably got anger management issues. Mark Darwin, wow. Seriously, some of the things he says is so much worse than what I've heard come out of AB's mouth. And I've heard some bad stuff come out of AB's mouth, but I mean, you know. But there's also part of the Voxes that you're going to find very boring. <laughs> because there's kind of this bromance that goes on between Adrian Brennock and Mark Darwin. After I've listened to the Voxes for a while and have been able to put them into some kind of time frame, I realise that there are messages going back and forth just in one day from these guys. And, mm, well, I'm not going to give away the, the juicy bits. I'll let you discover them for yourself. But in the estimate, there are 27 hours. It's a lot to listen through. And if you want to skip a part and not listen to bits, well, as I l upload them, you can choose to listen or not listen. The first one I'm going to upload is probably one of the most uh, hardest to listen to simply because, <laughs> well... I think there's not a person out there that wouldn't understand that with family and close friends, you can sometimes end up talking quite literally about shitting. <laughs> so, poor Mark Darwin and Adrian Brennock are having troubles in that area. And uh, some of the descriptions they give well, let's just say that could be information we didn't need to know. <laughs> but it's also very telling that in amongst everything that they are doing to other people, it is physically manifesting in their bodies the way that it is. And uh, I think that, uh, <laughs> yeah... I'll let the foxes speak for themselves. Sorry, it's not funny. It's co it's gross, but yes, I've just listened to so much of it, and just the thought of, you know, that that Cass, you know, his latest that he's still with Caroline Coman, Mark Diamond's partner. I mean, you should understand that the bromance comes first, bros before hoes. And as Mark Darwin said, you're just a piece of flange, you know. And, oh, wait, wait till you get to the ones where they say that women just stuff up everything they touch. You're going to love that one. So I intend to bring Uncensored and Unplugged. And if you can't handle it, if you're not a grown-up, <laughs> don't listen to them. But if you want to hear what really goes on behind the sales pitch, how many of you already have talked to Adrian Brennock, the current developer, even Mark McMurtry, or any of them that were involved with Bullah Bullah and wondered, well, what do they really think about me? I wonder if that's the truth. You know, it sounds too good to be true. Does a bit, doesn't it? Does sound a bit too good to be true? I mean, all this, you know, we can come and live in peace and harmony and, you know, everything will work and we've been working at this for so many years that we've covered every issue that could be covered and we've got it figured out. Well, let me the thing tell you the thing that they did figure out and it's in the voxes you will hear it for yourself that they figured out that democracy doesn't work 
that a benefactorial di dictatorship is ultimately what is needed. Because the investors, the people that they would call in to build this community with, are, well, they keep calling it like herding cats. Meow. Yeah, catty. And I tell you, some of the things that comes out of Mark Darwin's mouth makes catty seem... <laughs> Oh, it is dumbfounding how chauvinistic Mark Darwin is, how pompous and up himself he is, how self, how bloated on self-importance he is, you know, and he especially asserts that authority because I'm a man and I'm entitled to it. Well, the thing is that I actually saw Mark Darwin in an interview with saying that his father raised him to be a dick like that. But, you know, he chose to be this, that and the other. But clearly, all he did was learn how to be a salesman. To be something in reality and then to sell you on something different. And that's what I call a salesman. Anyone that takes reality and hides it behind a sales pitch. And that's what you're getting at Nightcap on Mingimble. A sales pitch. And that sales pitch has been going on for years. There has been sneaky dealings as they're doing all this stuff to the people that paid, that actually paid for the land and for the Mount Burrow commercial area and for them to say in, oh, tell you what, in these boxes they say, oh, we do it all for nothing and we get no thanks, rah, rah, rah. Nothing. Anytime anybody would put anything in the bank, there goes 20% to them. Anytime they want to claim back their food or electricity bills or any other bills, car registration, Boom, company expense, don't have to pay it. Then, well, not so much so after Adrian Brennock became a bankrupt, but up until that point, and if all the others are doing it, is $30,000 director's fee for this company that manages this aspect of the business that the investors that paid for this land and the Mount Burrow commercial area have no idea this company even exists to even pay the directors. But it doesn't matter because they're not allowed to see the books that where these directors are paid. And when they did ask to see the books, well, that's when everything started to fall apart at Bulla Bulla. When the investors, after so many empty promises, said, can we just have a look at these books and see what's supposed to be going on? You know, you're saying all this stuff, this gunner stuff, but nothing's really happening and we can't see why you're doing certain things because we've provided X amount of money in all of us people and we can't see where the money's gone. There should be money to do this and money to do that, but you're saying there's no money there and we owe money? How? So it was those kind of questions well, they were, that drew the community apart. That They were not going to tell them that, hey, look, we've taken all that money, we've gone and bought other properties, we've set up other deals, we're getting ready to dump yous in it and go over here onto Peter Van Leishout's land and set up over there. And then... After this land has gone into liquidation and it's sold, we'll buy it back and we'll just make it one big development. This was actually planned years ago as they're putting Lumban Horizons, which owns 3222 and this land through here, into liquidation. There was full intent that they would do exactly what they have actually done to buy it back. And you can see Adrian Brennock standing out the front in front of the for sale sign bragging about getting it back. So, you know, I know that there are a few uh, people that have come into the area that 
are not listening to what's been said out there when they should be. They think that all of these things that have been brought up by some people are just too outlandish. And some of the things said by some people may be a little bit of a different version of the truth of how others see it. And I suppose that's the kindest way for saying is that if um, you tell someone a story, they can repeat the story as is. If they want to be a victim, they will embellish it with lots of drama and effects and try and make it about them. If they want to make you laugh, are you getting my guest here, is that the essence of what went on can be interpreted differently by any number of people. And just because someone interprets it differently in their reality, it does not negate the reality of the overall truth of it. And I've heard people dismiss, you know, things that have been said about this because Gillian Linda Norman's name comes into it. See, I'm even calling her Gillian Linda now because they keep calling her Gillian Linda. Her name is Gillian Norman. You know? but anyway, so they keep making a big fuss about this. And it's been one of those things that they've used for years to actually say, well, you know, look, here's a judgment now. And she was wrong. She's been shown to be wrong. Well, that's one person out of 20. And the sad thing about the whole scenario with Julia Norman is that there was an abundance of evidence she was never able to present. Simply, the cases never got to that stage in the cases where it could have been shown. And where it could have been shown, the focus was more on proving someone's version of events that went on in the community than taking that base truth and working with that which is what the judge wanted, the basic truth, the basic evidence, and what is the accusation against that. It was, um, yes. But anyway, the thing being that this has done a lot to discredit the fact that people think, oh, well, you know, she lost. The information's wrong. Well... <laughs> Sadly, if you think that and you have bought in on the belief of that, you are going to find out for yourself. And I am 100% convinced of that, that the only thing that is the difference between you and the past lost investors that were getting set up and screwed over is time. When you ask for the money back, there is no money. It gets spent in a heartbeat. Adrian Brennock tells you that. You're buying into a concept, not a reality. There is nothing to get back. The only way you can get it back is to sell the land. And then you might have a bit of a problem because the land still technically belongs to Peter Van Lyshout and... Did you have a contract with him? Oh, something's not smelling quite right here, is it? Because that's another thing that hasn't been clearly defined. There are distinct owners after they intend to set up 10 rural land sharing communities and this village, there will still be those distinct owners. And if there is no movement of shareholdings where anybody buying in has a, a legal share in the legal landowners' companies. You've got no legal rights whatsoever. You can't even try... Oh. In fact, the situation that you would find yourself in is a lot worse than what the people found themselves in at Bulla Bulla. 
because they have certainly set it up to avoid what happened at Bulla Bulla from happening to their bigger, grander scheme plan of things. This has been on the hatch for years. And I don't think Mark Darwin actually wanted to be bothered with it anymore. That's why he pulled out publicly. But he's still in every company that is associated with them. All he did was go from being an active investor to being a passive investor or shareholder. I still believe that he and Adrian Brennock a good bros. And just like I've heard them say it in Voxes that Mark Darwin is a really good salesman. He pretends to be your friend and he pretends that he's on your side so that you'll tell him all your secrets. So he'll go running back to AB and tell him them all and they'll laugh about you behind your back because you trusted him. And they think they're so clever. Well... You know who I think the cleverest person was? The one that was able to get all the voxes in the first place. Not so clever to cover all your bases and your back doors, are you? <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to finish it off now and just say that when I upload the voxes through the series, I'm going to upload them as uniquely identifiable so you don't have to pick at any videos and say, oh, well, is this one about it or not? They're all going to be uncensored and unplugged, part one through to how many <laughs> parts it takes to get through and bring it all out in the open. And then once you're done, maybe those people out there that don't understand that the current developers have not got their best interests in mind. They've got their best interests in mind. <laughs> you might understand that, um, well, I don't know, I just kept thinking of that uh, Nickelback song, you know, kiss it goodbye, goodbye. Because that's what you did to your money the second you handed it over. And good luck trying to get the land too, to sell it to get your money back like the past investors at Bulla Bulla did. Because as I said, technically speaking, they haven't paid for the land. It still is legally titled to Peter Van Lyshout. And your contract is not with Peter Van Lyshout, is it? So you can't sell his land to get your money back. Yep. Now if you do find yourself at the raw end of the deal in that area, listen to these foxes then you will understand how you ended up in that position because they are not going to make the same mistakes twice. Because in the start, they're very cocky. You know, things are going right for them. <laughs> then they get unexpected actions. And, uh, yeah, that sort of brings them down to earth a bit starts him feeling a little bit sorry for himself it's good to hear <laughs> anyway as I said if you can make it through the first video it's a little bit painful to listen to them talking about shit literally <laughs> but you know if you're going to be uncensored and unplugged and I'm not holding back anything I'll give it all to you as I can hear it myself let you judge for yourself. Are these developers you want to deal with? <laughs> Catch you next time. Bye.